in the 16th century. We have to realize this is an enormous gap of time. Assuming ancient Mayan and modern Mayan are pronounced the same is like assuming that Old English and modern English are the same. Furthermore, a, a very another interesting situation that Scherer says in his book, page 582, there are 28 modern Mayan languages. I was not quite aware of that. That is enormous. It is likely that different Maya dialects were also spoken anciently with no single universal ancient pronunciation for the glyphs. This is Scherer again, 589 to 590. So what is, what is the implication of all this? It's nearly impossible to know the ancient phonetic pronunciation of classic Mayan personal and place names. Now the catch, unfortunately for us, we LDS are not crowing about this, saying this is wonderful news. We're just simply dealing with the data. And the problem is, without that phonetic data, how do we determine if a particular emblem glyph was pronounced Zarahemla by the Maya in ancient times? It's actually more complex than this, but uh, Hamlin's just trying to demonstrate the problem. And then the issue, there must have been written texts because the Book of Mormon says there were. Well, we do have some evidence in the pre-classic writing, at least from 500 BC, in three different cultural zones. Unfortunately, they've all been destroyed. Well, if it's unlikely that vast libraries of ancient texts can be destroyed, Perhaps we need to show the surviving text from the hundreds and thousands of scrolls once housed in libraries in Alexandria, or the equally large library at Pergamum. Not a single one of the hundreds of thousands of scrolls once kept in these libraries survive. It's obvious. Vast, huge amounts of libraries disappear. Crime and the entire civilizations have disappeared. Barring some papyri fragments found uniquely in Egypt, all surviving ancient Greek and Roman books exist largely in copies of copies of copies from the 8th century A.D. or later. See, with Homer's Iliad, the earliest complete manuscript is from the 10th century A.D. This is 2,000 years after Homer. And the only reason it survives is because Byzantine aristocrats valued Homer as literature, and so they copied it. It's it's a very, unfortunately, the other aspect, the survival of ancient books is aberrant, of course, but the other aspect is the Book of Mormon does say that the Lamanites were systematically destroying Nephite records, Mormon 6 and 6. They make fun of the idea that the scrolls all turn to rot. Well, there's no mention of writing on scrolls in the Book of Mormon anyway. The clay tablets were crushed to powder. There's no mention of writing on clay tablets in the Book of Mormon anyway. Stone engravings were systematically defaced. Well, are there examples of Nephites writing on stone? The, there is a mention of a Jaredite stone engraving in Omni 1, 20 and 21. The lengthy Olmec stone inscriptions are known, actually, So this might be in favor of the Book of Mormon. Nothing written has survived from these highly literate civilizations. The assumption here is that the Book of Mormon does not describe highly literate civilizations. When we analyze the record, all of the mention of writing in the Book of Mormon is associated with a particular scribal lineage preserving their clan records. Of course, there's exceptions mostly the elite, and they exchange epistles. And this implies literacy was an elite phenomenon, actually. Well, it's interesting. The reason we can't identify Nephite sites is because we lack sufficient texts that give the ancient pronunciation of the proper names that allow us to identify these Nephite sites. How much easier can it be? How can we possibly expect to determine if a particular site is or is not Zarahemla if we don't know the ancient name of that site? If we had the same quantity and the same quality of data in pre-classic Mesoamerica that we do for the pre-Greek Near East, we would be able to decisively resolve the issue one way or the other. But unfortunately, we don't. The surviving evidence is what it is. Pretending it's something else, or that it is more than it should be, is is not a proper substitute for the proper historical method. 
See, the point is, the Book of Mormon does not fail this test. There simply is not yet enough data for the test to be undertaken. And this is an important point that Hamblin keeps making. And what I want to do is, he's made this point uh, several times in other writings of his. But what I want to do is I want to share... I want to share an idea here. Now, one of the books that I had to study when I was majoring in history to get my bachelor's degree in history is Paul K. Konkin and Roland N. Stromberg, The Heritage and Challenge of History. They note on page 153, and this connects really well with what Hamblin is trying to say on, the, uh, on his discussion. No empirically validated explanatory concepts can ever be all-inclusive, for they relate only the aspects of experience to which we adapt them. Since there seem to be no empirical laws governing the total historical process, the historian cannot work with a tight, selective, conceptual system. He does not apply historical laws to individual cases or show how one can deduce individual historical events from such laws. Even at the less general level of class terms, it's hard to find any classifications except possibly rough chronological periodizations that are peculiarly historical. The concepts and the words used by a historian are usually those of pre-scientific common sense. It's very interesting. <laughs> very interesting idea here. As, as G. Ernest Wright, one of the great biblical archaeologists, I have this wonderful book, The Bible in Its Literary Milieu, edited by John Meyer and Vincent Tollers. G. Ernest Wright has a contribution in this, his chapter is what archaeology can and cannot do. And this is true for the basis of a historical Abraham, or a historical Jesus, or even historical Nephites and Lamanites in Mesoamerica. He does note, Wright does note, as Bill Hamblin has properly noted, this is on page 168. Palestine, west of the Jordan, is the most intensively dug and explored area of its size in the world. Even the new methodologies fail to extract a maximum of information from the occupational debris of antiquity. In other words, Bill Hamblin's right. There is a limitation to the data. Of course. Now, on page 169... With regard to biblical events, however, it cannot be overstressed that archaeological data are mute. I'm going to say this again. It's not that I'm simply trying to take Bill Hamblin's stance because he is LDS and so am I. I'm trying to understand, as a historian as well as Hamblin, the nature and the processes of historical inquiry, because of course I'm, I'm doing this long series on the book of Abraham, and on the facsimiles, and I have to get into the ancient Egyptians, and the ancient Hebrews, and so on and so forth. We 